In earlier presentations I showed how all signals are made up of sinusoids, but those sinusoids are of different amplitudes, frequencies and phases. In this presentation I'm going to show you how to use the FFT function in MATLAB to analyze a discrete signal in order to determine the amplitudes, frequencies and phases of the sinusoids present in the signal. Um, now the FFT function can be used to analyze any discrete signal, but if in this example I'm going to use a very uh, well-defined signal which has three sinusoids in it. So this signal X has three sinusoids. Um, and the reason why I'm doing that is because if we know the sinusoids that are already in the signal, we can just verify that the FFT function works correctly. So in this case, uh, the frequencies of the components are 20 hertz, 30 hertz, and 40 hertz. So F1, F2, and F3. And there's my corresponding F1, F2, and F3. So the 20 hertz component is an amplitude of, two, of 3 and a phase shift of 0 0.2. The 30 hertz component has an amplitude of 1 and a phase shift of minus 0 0.3 radians. And the amplitude of the 40 hertz component is an amplitude of 2 and a phase shift of 2.4 radians. Now the length of the signal is that I'm going to analyze. Well, the length of the signal I'm going to analyze is 1.5 seconds long. Now I've subtracted a little bit off that length, and the reason for that won't be obvious, but hopefully by the time you fully understand the FFT function, um, you'll appreciate why, but that, that will take some time. Um, the sampling frequency is 1000, so if it's a length of 1.5 seconds, the signal should be um, 1500 samples long. So let's just plot X first of all. I'll we'll just resize it. Okay, So there's my time domain signal, which results when I add the three sinusoids together. I've got 1500 samples, and there's my amplitude axis here. Now, Using the FFT function is actually very simple, so I'm going to apply my FFT function. I'm going to create a new variable X. I'm going to use that capital X to store the frequency domain information associated with the time domain signal lowercase x. Now this is a very common convention to use where lowercase symbols are used to store time domain information, whereas uppercase symbols are used to store frequency domain information. So what's going to happen is the FFT function will analyze the time domain signal X and store the result in the uppercase uh, variable, capital X. And when I hit return, all that work is done. All that's happened is the FFT function has been used to analyze X. Now, the number of samples in X is 1500. So that time domain signal has 1500 samples. Now, the new variable capital X also has 1500 values but those values aren't samples they're referred to as bin frequencies so there's 1500 bin values stored in the, the variable capital X and while X has lots of uh, real values so I'll just show you a few samples I'll show you from sample number 2 to 10 or 2 to 6 all those values are real values for the lowercase uh, signal. We've just created it. But the bin values are complex numbers. And I'm going to show you from bins number 30 up to, let's say, 34. Just show you a few samples, just or a few bin values, just to show you. So there are, um, there's bins number 30. That's bin number 30. It's a value of 0 minus 0j. Um, bin number 31 is a non-zero value. Uh, bin number 32 is a, also a, a zero value, as is bin number 33, and, and here is bin number 34. But you can see they're all complex values. And the complex values are used because they represent both magnitude and phase. And remember that the FFT is trying to determine the magnitudes and phases of the sinusoids present in a signal. Now, <laughs> Looking at the data like this is very difficult. Uh, it's difficult to interpret sequences of numbers like that. So it's more common to plot the magnitude spectrum uh, or plot the frequency spectrum. But what we're going to focus in on is the magnitude spectrum first of all. So we're just going to look at the magnitude values associated with these complex numbers. So what I'm going to do now is just extract the magnitude data from the capital X value, which is a set of complex numbers. 
and I'll just hit return. That ABS function is a built-in function of MATLAB to, to determine the magnitude values of complex numbers. Uh, we'll take a look at the um, the 30 bins number 30 up to 34 again, but this time we're just going to look at the magnitude values and we relate it to the complex numbers up here. So the magnitude of bin number 30 is a value of 0 and that's the corresponding complex number. The magnitude of bin number 31 is a value of 2.25 multiplied by 1000, so that's 2250 and that corresponds to this complex number. And you can see that the rest of the complex numbers are 0, so therefore their magnitudes are 0. Now what I'll do now is just plot the entire magnitude spectrum, as it's called. So x mag is my entire magnitude spectrum. And there is the magnitude spectrum. You can see that there is values of 0 up to 1500. These are the frequency bins. Okay. Um, now this range of values between 0 and 1500, that will vary depending on the length of the signal. The time domain signal that I created had 1500 samples and that's why I have 1500 bins as well. Now you'll notice that on the left hand side here I have th three spikes. Okay, Each of those spikes corresponds to a frequency component. Or in other words, they correspond to sinusoidal components. Now on the left hand side I have the three components but I also have another set of three components on the right. Now what you should notice is that the right hand side components are a mirror image of the left hand, hand side components and this is going to be the case any time you plot the magnitude spectrum. Um, well, I'll put a caveat on that for signals that you're going to deal with and the signals you're going to deal with are real signals. So just for the moment just accept that any time you plot the magnitude spectrum we really just need to focus in on the uh, left-hand side of the magnitude spectrum. So I'm just going to zoom in on the left-hand side because the right-hand side information is effectively redundant. Okay, so there's the left-hand side of the magnitude spectrum. I am just going to um, put a few labels on this. This is my frequency axis um, and this is my magnitude axis. Now the frequency axis isn't in Hertz, it's rather it's in bins. Okay, and that's just a term that you need to get used to the same way as in the time domain you're dealing with uh, samples. In frequency domain you're dealing with bins. So this isn't written in here but I'll just put 750 there because halfway up is 750. Um, now frequency in bins can be easily converted into frequency in hertz and the rule is actually quite straightforward. Um, this here, halfway up in this case 750, is always corresponds to half the sampling frequency. Now in our case the sampling frequency was 1000 Hz. There's 1000 Hz. That means that this frequency is 500 Hz. Now it's important that you, you remember that no matter what number of numbers appear in terms of bins, so if there was a million bins and halfway up was 500,000, well then that 500,000 would still correspond to half the sampling frequency. So I might just make a note here, this is always fs over 2, this point. That means that halfway down along here, around this point here, it's about halfway down, that would correspond to 250 hertz. And halfway down again, which is roughly around there somewhere, that would be 125 hertz and this point here would be roughly 60 hertz. Now you can see that all these three components lie between about 10 hertz and 60 hertz and if you recall when I created the signal the three sinusoids that we or the three sinusoids in the signal that we created were frequencies 30 or 20 hertz, 30 hertz and 40 hertz. Now let's take another look at this. Um, Oh, my pen has gone. I might just try to restart that. Sorry, a bit of a problem there. Just give me one second. I'm just going to reset something. And I'll start it up again. It's just the pen application that I'm using. It needs to be restarted every so often. Um, so I'm just going to click OK. Now my pen should be back. OK. So we had identified that this halfway up point of 750 bins corresponds to 500 hertz. 
and we'd also said that this point here was about 60 Hertz and this was frequency and this was magnitude now looking at these uh, we see there's three components and we, what we can say is the amplitude of this component looks like it's about 1500 this one here looks about half that amplitude so this one here looks at about 750 whereas this one here looks like it's one and a half times that uh, so that's about 2200 up there okay so analyzing that signal a little bit further what I could say is that the there are three frequencies present we call that F low for the lowest frequency component or the lowest sinusoid this one here we call it FM the middle frequency and we label this one as F high and what I could say is that the middle frequency component is half the amplitude of the highest one and one third of the amplitude of the lower one so I'm doing if I was just looking at this signal in the frequency domain and I knew nothing about the signal what I would be saying is that there are three sinusoids present um, there are the amplitude of the middle one is one third of the amplitude of the lower one and half the amplitude of the higher one okay what I'd also say is that there is no frequencies present for all other frequencies and the reason I say that is because the amplitude of all these frequencies down here following that blue line there are all zero so that tells me that there's no sinusoids um, in, the, in that frequency range okay and that's a basic that's basically how you analyze the magnitude spectrum of a signal using the FFT the most difficult thing is actually getting the scale of the frequency axis right and being able to flip between bin number and frequency in Hertz um, now let's just quit that and go back into the the time domain representation of the signal so I'm just going to plot it out or write it out here again now we can see that the lowest frequency here's the lowest frequency uh, as a frequency we know that well I'll just write it out again F1 is 20 F2 is 30 and F3 is 40 we can see that the lowest frequency is three times the 20 Hertz or the 30 Hertz component okay three times that one that middle one is a amplitude of one whereas the other one the lowest frequency is an amplitude of two or sorry an amplitude of three the higher frequency is an amplitude of two uh, which is twice the middle frequency which is what we saw in this magnitude sp spectrum okay so straight away we can see how the magnitude spectrum is used to identify the presence of sinusoids now the next piece of information that you just need to get used to is to get the angle or phase information from the magnitude spectrum or not from the magnitude spectrum but from the um, magnitude information which we've stored in that variable what we're going to do is create another variable called um, x phase and that's going to be equal to the angle of capital X and this is very similar to the absolute function except instead of getting the magnitude it gets the phase information from X which if you remember is a set of complex numbers okay now what I'm going to do now is try to find the uh, the phase values of the three components so I'm just going to open up the magnitude spectrum again and try to find the bin number so here's the bin number here of one of the components hold on I'll do that again just slower so you can see what I'm doing um, what I want to find is the um, phase values of each of these bins so I'm just going to zoom in on this one here to find out the bin number so the bin number of that one is 31 see that there that's number 31 let's get the corresponding phase of that I'll, I'll just need to type X phase 31 and we see we get a value of 0 0.2 I'm going to zoom in the other two peaks now just to see what their um, bin numbers are so let's just zoom out a bit I'll zoom in on this smaller bin and it's got a, a bin number 46 so the phase value of 46 minus 0 0.3 and I'll zoom out on the magnitude spectrum again 
Let's zoom in on the third peak. Let's do that. So there is the third peak. Let's zoom in on it. Its bin number is 61. So let's get the phase value associated with that. 61. So 2.4. So let's remind ourselves what x is again. And we can see that the phase value of the third of the highest frequency component is 2.4, which matches this. The phase value of the middle frequency component is zero point, minus 0 0.3, which you can see here. And the phase value of the lowest frequency component is 0 0.2. And we can see that matches. So basically, what I've shown you is that the uh, FFT can be used to extract the phase information from the signal. I've also shown you in the magnitude spectrum, I'll just bring, here's the magnitude spectrum again. Magnitude spectrum is used to show you the relative phase diff or the relative amplitudes of the various components. And generally that's all you're really interested in. You want to be able to say, well, what's, where's the spectral energy lie in a signal? So in this case, for example, the spectral energy lies in the, uh, in, in the low frequency region. Uh, and we could actually say there's spectral energy between 10 hertz and 60 hertz and no spectral energy outside of that range. So they're the general observations you make when you look at signals in the frequency domain. Now I could get the absolute values of these, but they're, it's not really that important. I'll, I'll show you how to do it, but uh, I wouldn't be overly worried about doing this. If I wanted to get the, plot the, the, get the absolute values of those um, signals, I could divide by the FFT len, or half the FFT len, sorry, which in this case is 750. So if I divide all the magnitude values by 750, I'll get the um, absolute magnitude values. So there, I've just done it. I've plotted the magnitude spectrum. I've scaled the amplitude axis, and you can see that the lowest frequency now has a value of 2, or sorry, of 3. The middle frequency has a value of 1, and the highest frequency is a value of 2, which corresponds to the time domain signal that we created. Okay, so that's a quick overview of how to use the FFT function. Um, there's plenty more to it. Uh, this is kind of a simplified view, and I'll, I'll try to put together a few more demonstrations to show you how to do it. Anyway, thanks for your attention.